we are discussing a technique that I introduced or arguably simply produced my version of all the way back mm -hmm. in 2002 um, in yeah. uh, my publication, The Sorcerer's Soul. Um, and it's called The Relationship Map. I could just start with this huge rant about how everybody messed up my concept and doesn't do it right. But now that I've stated that I could do that, I promise that's not what I'm going to do. And instead, sort of, and instead we'll, uh, we'll try to get something constructive out of this. So, first of all, let's start with your input. What have you encountered about the term or the concept as you see it, and in what way has it affected play, prep, other aspects of role-playing? for you so anybody okay so uh, one game I've played which kind of used the relationship map is of the Icelanders which kind well I don't know if it's, if it's standard because I mean I wasn't running it but um, it kind of started building a huge web of interrelationships between the players characters and their associated characters that they uh, kind of wished into existence through the um, character creation bit uh, which then proceeds to um, uh, rapidly descend into a, a web of uh, 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 complicated relationships and hatreds. And I was going to say murder, and betrayal, action. you know, every imaginable. All the, all the good things you get in Icelandic saga. Yeah. Right. Well, to review that a little bit, as I recall, Saga of the Icelanders has a lot in common with a slightly earlier game called Ganakagok in which your characters are sort of major nodes in that map. And then their relations, their enemies, basically everybody else that they interact with is drawn on it. Now in Ganakagok, it's actually a process of character creation that you actually end up creating this great big crazy diagram. Is that how it works in Saga of the Icelanders? Um, yes, I think so. Well, like I say, I'm, I'm not vastly familiar with the game but what we did when we did it was um the character creation process throughout some uh the player characters as major nodes in this and then i was playing the man so i had, obviously had a wife and in five various sort of mm -hmm. other people in the homestead um some of them were then player characters and therefore that also proved they must have this associated character i think there's a sort of you can choose things that the mm -hmm. npcs that you, um uh, bring into existence, or you pick your relationship is in there, I can't actually copy remember. Um, uh, so, um, sort of who is having an illicit relationship? I'm having a illicit relationship, my character's having an illicit relationship with this other character, therefore, now exists as a node. Now, now some of those can be ties of kin and sex, but they can also be just history of different kinds or social relationships. Like sworn to serve and stuff like that, right? Yeah, that's right. So it's it's it's, I'm, it's a bit um, more loosey goosey than, than your strict blood and sex relationship. Now. And so um, another point about it is that it basically creates this enormous community, which is a big part of Saga of the Icelanders. It's yes. a big part of Ganakagok, and also in slightly less community terms, it reminds me too of Vincent's technique in In a Wicked Age whereby every player character basically gets written down onto the page and then you draw arrows among them about their conflicts of interest. How does this one, you know, well, the, he calls it the, the best interest. What's the best interest of this character? And so then you show, they write like to what their best interest is directed or might be directed toward them. And then other player characters actually draw arrows to interfere with those best interests. So in many ways, it sets the characters in various, at least initially, conflicting situations. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens in Tales of Entropy, the game I've been consulting for, where, where again, at least as written, you have a bunch. You write down the player characters' names, and then you create a web work off of them, which interacts in all kinds of different ways. Again, in Tales of Entropy, pretty antagonistic. Whereas with with uh, Saga of the Icelanders, there's going to be a lot of conflict in there, but the player characters, are they enjoined to be directly targeting one another in some way? I am not sure. 
<clears throat> we very much were. Mm -hmm. but this was a, a one shot, so it kind of mm -hmm. makes it. If you do a bit of that point, it makes it more likely that something will happen if you're doing it for like you know, three hours of an evening. It's an indie mate where we, you know, there people there all the time anyway. There's a certain amount of uh, regression to the mean, I think. Honestly. Anyone else? But some of the relationships. Are very oh, much sorry. Different. No. Cool. Okay, thanks, Ross. Um, anyone else? Um, one thing which which resembles it, but isn't quite a relationship map, I think, is uh, the way you create the towns in Dogs in the Vineyard, mm -hmm. which has the, the 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 hierarchy of sins and people connecting to one another, and the, the but it's more, more uh, uh, it's something you use uh, to prepare for a game. To figure out, well, this is the, uh, the, the, the the priest or the person, but he's committed this sin with this person, and you try to get all, to connect all the townspeople together mm -hmm. in a sort of web of consequence and um, interest, and um, well, just think of anything you want to connect to connect those. You also have the interesting entity that he calls in the game. The game mechanic is called the demons, yeah. but in the fiction, can be anything from, you know, literal supernatural malevolent entities, all the way down to merely bad luck. Yeah, which is why you use the demons in a given scenario as the opposition role to in any situation where a character is not involved. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, so that's, I think, an interesting aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Here's the big difference between Dogs in the Vineyard and what Ross was describing, um, which is that the player characters aren't in that map. Yeah, of course. So that's a, a big deal, actually. Or a pre-preparation uh, for play and, uh, and something the players encounter during the mm -hmm. course of play, and then it mm -hmm. either explodes or mm -hmm. things happen. Things pull at the player characters to, to make things happen. Mm -hmm. So more like the sorcerer style of relationship map, right? Yes, although I was going to kind of have the discussion of what I was talking about be its own little entity a little bit later in the conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, without necessarily privileging it. Mm -hmm. um, so I help. Any? Uh, sure. Uh, so one, um, so two Different uh, kinds of uh, relationship maps that I sort of see are uh, relationship maps as a helping technique to as a, to to uh, to help you organize information of play. So to keep track of things, to keep uh, track of, of people and how they relate to each other, and that's usually more on the side. And maybe it's not even part of the text of the game. It's just like a GM technique use. Or maybe the text, the text of the game tells you about it, but it's not really integrated with the rest of the game. And the other, and that could be, uh, I mean, that, there's games that talk about that, uh, or games that re you read and you're like, yeah, a resource map would be useful here. Um, in that case, it's the, a lot. It's a and it, just let me jump in there. In that case, it's almost an org, what we call an org chart, an organization chart. Yeah, basically. and it's very useful when you have lots of clans or lots of corporations and stuff like that. And um, the first game that actually used it as a visual technique, where the game master was supposed to make one, was the supplement for GURPS, GURPS Goblins. That's the first one that introduced those. And you're right, to a greater or lesser extent, that particular technique for these complicated institutional backgrounds, tribes, or whatever. Um, and then you have little arrows saying, you know, this tribe hates that tribe, or, or whatever. Or have a little guy circled in one of them who's actually, you know, serving this other one mm -hmm. while he's inside this one. Um, that Those have either verbally or visually entered role-playing with that supplement. And been you can observe it, you know, all the way along since then. So, sorry, go ahead. That's... Sure. Uh, one problem with that approach, that it depends a lot on where do you find it and how do you, how it's explained to you, is that sometimes uh, you may not know or what's the best thing, uh, what's the best elements that you support in the chart, chart, 
Uh, yeah, it like, could be anything. Maybe you, yeah, yeah uh, like, for example, in Urban Shadows, uh, the PBTA uh, World of Darkness-ish game, uh, I created a resource map, and I don't know if I, it's because I ignore the, the text of the game or uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but I, the relationships, I just put the um, the streams, the, I don't remember how they call it, but like the mechanical streams among, uh, among players. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it is in that particular version. Yeah, what was Depth, it called? Yeah. Ah, okay. Depth. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that depths uh, accumulate and they go away really quick. Like they're they constantly changing. So at the end, it was useless because I, I had to be taking it so so often that I will just... At some yeah, point that I would be like creating out. a map of hit points for everybody. You're like, why am yeah. I going over there putting it on the common sheet? You know, it's driving me nuts. Yeah. So one important thing to take in account is like consider what you should be putting there. Mm -hmm. And the other kind is like what, the, what we're talking about, about that is more integrated with, uh, with the system, with, the play, with play. Uh, for example, um, another example that I have here, which is the ah. diceless vampire uh, vampire game? It has pretty. Hey guys, you want to make a pool, a little gambling pool, and each of the four of us will guess how many vampire games Angel actually owns, <laughs> and then whoever comes closest gets a prize so or something. What, you know? <laughs> what, uh, okay, <laughs> let's not get into that. Uh, so yeah, in this game, the relationship map is very much a procedure of play that you create at the beginning, and it tells you how do you make the okay. So the the characters you do like a circle, and the relationships are these, and you put this inside the circles, mm -hmm. and when they this changes, you you change this in the chart, and it's much more involved with the rest of the system and more central. That actually sounds kind of interesting. I mean, the fact yeah, that you yeah. actually have mechanical techniques for changing it through the course of play in it's some kind more, of connected or symbolic fashion. I don't know. But. Uh, it's more like uh, it tells you, uh, for example, when in this game, the, it does tell you to, uh, to you, the relationships that you draw are depths, are what would be depths in Urban Shadows, for example. Mm -hmm. But one, they are not so, they are not so stackable. Right. Like you can either have a strong depth or a minor depth. So it is less confusion. And it and it tells you things like when you that depth goes away, you don't erase it. You right. just uh, cross it. So it has some interesting stuff with with that. Oh like are you getting an idea of the kind of thing we're talking about? Yeah, I uh, I know what you're talking about, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm just trying to think if I um like of the essence, if I encounter it somewhere, um, um, like exactly, maybe not. But uh, the the technique is um, I use it sometimes when I have uh, a really complicated. Like usually, I write a uh, connection between characters, just like a simple phrases or clocks taken mm -hmm. from Apocalypse work. So basically, character can have instinct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which she, which it follows usually, and if it has something personal with, like player or any other entity in the game, then there are create a clock for it. Like it will trigger after some time, like for something specific or like some like right. Let's say vector, yeah, of mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when it gets a lot of it, yeah, then like I would maybe uh, maybe like. It's closer to like a memory map, yeah. Like when you can write uh, bubbles and like connect them with a different arrows, and uh, at the arrows you can write what is this, what is this influencing, like the hate or uh, betrayal or you know something, something else. Um, yeah, and yeah, what what uh, Anhel said about uh, urban shadows, where there is uh, a lot of strings and a lot of, like depths, yeah. Not strings, uh, right? But yeah, and you should like. But uh, yeah, I, I, as you said, it's. I think it's not necessary to keep like a map of it. Yeah, just yeah. write who have depths on whom. And yeah, that's why I ended up doing that well. Yeah, that's that's similar to Monster Hearts. Yeah, when you have yeah. strings. Oh, by the way, uh, that remind reminds me. In Monster Hearts, uh, it has a similar but a slightly different procedure, which is you don't create a relationship map. 
you will you create the map of the class and right, you right. Uh, we didn't do that in our game but you usually do that Ooh, and you say who is sitting where yeah. in relation to the teacher who are the bad boys at the back who are the smart i kind of i kind of did that in my head you know mm -hmm. as part of play from what yeah, we did from what we, we did kind of doing a hurry yeah. with it yeah. so i kind of yeah. Uh, yeah, that's I can add something. Yeah, uh, like I'm overall terrible at making notes. So that uh, when I'm jamming, I'm remembering half of the stuff. Right. I'm putting, I'm noting after the game and creating just like this clocks or something like some actions that might happen uh, if something will be happening in the game. Uh, I think something similar to um. In Dungeon World 2, when you have front, that... Oh, yeah. <coughs> sorry, Peter. Oh, sorry, Oleg. That, in, yeah. that, in, sure. yeah. uh, that influence each other in a certain way and are connected. So, yeah, that's that's where, where I use it sometimes. But, yeah, that's, maybe because I never had the opportunity to um, conduct really, like, um, Jeez. diplomatic or, like, with a complex relationship uh, game. Uh, so, so it was just unnecessary. Uh, the sim simplify. If we don't have to, I think simplify way is better. But yeah, then if we like digging inside, like connections between like NPCs somewhere in the background, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only players, then yeah, mm -hmm. then, then probably that would help. That is necessary, maybe even. There's that's why some yeah. some systems suggested. That's why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the what I've seen just from what we've talked about is uh, a bunch of actually really different variables. So we're really talking about really different applications of the extremely basic idea that characters have relationships that communities exist with their institutions sometimes, and then you also have history in a given place. Yeah. Um, those are some pretty different things sometimes. One of the big distinctions that I already pointed to was that some of these devices, and let's be really broad and even include just the device of, you know, the game master keeping a notebook of all their play crap, right, of the, for that game. Let's, I mean, we, we don't even have to, rule or no rule, text or no, no, game text or no tech game text is not really the issue. So um, one of them is whether player characters are in such a... A, a visual device um, and that is kind of important because sometimes they're the starting points when you make it other times they have no place in it even later so it's so there that's a big difference right there and another one is whether it uh, is made by the group through individual decisions by many, you know, all the people in play for different parts, or whether this is something that one person has made and that it is, uh, you know, that, that this is sort of something that the others will encounter. Um, another important part has to do with whether we're talking about, I mean, you could put in something like, and I think, Ganakagok is like this, which is why I keep bringing it up as sort of an extreme example. Anything goes, whether it's clan membership, whether it's an emotion, whether it's a past event, whatever it is, it counts. You can draw a line. And so that game's sort of infamous for its big map being just, it's, it's, it's almost like where isn't there a line on it? So, um... If you want to be more specific, you can have things like here are the institutions and here are the members of the institutions. Or you could say it's all emotions. All we're doing is writing out all the characters and we're just drawing an arrow and putting whatever emotion is involved. Um, one, a good example of a game like that was by Elizabeth Sampat called It's Complicated where those arrows of emotions pointing to other characters actually were, as I recall, almost the only mechanic in the game. Then there's also, let's see, don't, 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 here we go, right. Whether what's, what's organizing it could be other principles as well, um, like in, in my example. 
Um, so to summarize, I guess, in the Sorcerer's Soul, what I proposed uh, was, and, and bearing in mind, this actually wasn't supposed to be a generic technique for playing Sorcerer, or indeed a generic technique at all. It was supposed to be specific to the concerns in that supplement, which was called the Sorcerer's Soul. Um, and the idea was that this is for play in which a complex and unpredictable, mostly unknown background was being encountered by player characters. So right off the gate, right off the bat, this wasn't a player technique. This was a game master technique. And also, uh, it was intended to solve certain problems. It was, okay, so what it was, was you simply wrote down all the non-player characters, and if any of them was related by family, you charted it. And so, therefore, you would put, you know, two parents next to each other, and then from that line, you would draw their kids and, you know, sort of little genealogical chart, if you will, in terms of family. Then you also drew lines for any sexual contacts. Mm -hmm. Edge cases were definitely, you know, permitted, an, an adopted child, for example, or anything like that. Um edge cases of, you know, about to have an affair or something like that, whatever, something, anything of that kind, you know, formerly betrothed or something, all those kind of anything that's vaguely inclusive in or included in those two terms, but nothing else, no institutional ties, no emotions in there, no emotions, no opinions, uh, you know, friendship, I sometimes I said it was okay to have like mini figs, mini figures sticking off of individuals. So if you had an individual and they had a buddy, you sort of made them sort of a subset of his category. So he was kind of an auxiliary piece of that. So that was my idea of a relationship map. It was not supposed to be an all-inclusive summary of everything in your preparation. It was only supposed to be an auxiliary piece for that, for those specific kind of relationships. So then if you had who murdered who, if you had, you know, all that other stuff, everything else imaginable, um, was your, was your notes. Now, certain problems, this solved certain problems really easily. You could say, what just happened in play? What are all the other elements in play that are going on? Let me look at my relationship map and say, oh, yes, you know, for some reason it was very, very helpful to glance at it in play and it would completely help you decide how this non-player character was going to react to things. Mm -hmm. um, another important thing that this was supposed to be part of was that play was supposed to be unpredictable. You're not supposed to have a final climactic moment you know, anyone can die. If this person you think of in your GM heart that this person is the worst person in the story, well, you know, maybe they'll die in the first scene, depending on what happens. You still have the whole relationship map to work off of. The important point was that in such a map, if something happens to any character or regarding any of their interests, everyone else is going to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. That's the important part. And that makes it way easier to play. And then you also find that when player characters encounter those individuals, the information that they have about them, here are the two brothers. Um, here is, you know, oh, and, and then things they don't know that they find out later. Wait, that's your daughter? You know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it was very surprising to people back in 2002, and it surprised me how little this was being used in play at the time. People were playing all sorts of games and wondering why it never quite seemed to have much depth. And then they started using a lot more family ties and stuff upon reading The Sorcerer's Soul. And then game design in that community just boomed and you had people scribbling, you know, every which way, and you started seeing this whole range of techniques that everybody just started calling relationship maps, um, which is fine, I guess. But the, uh, 
the the idea though is that we're really talking about some very different things for some very different purposes. Yeah. Um, one quick question in relation to your uh, to the relationship mapping sorcerer. One thing that surprised me while reading it is that as it appears in the text, at least as I understood it, you are supposed to take these relationships from a book. Uh, oh, specifically, yeah, that was the uh, that was the technique at the time. Yeah, uh -huh. go ahead. Yeah, you recommend uh, 20th century de detective stories. That's right. Which I, I found interesting. I had never thought of well, taking that for a, for a book to use it as a starting point. Well, it was uh, kind of a of an important issue for the sorcerer's soul um, because I really, really liked everything in sorcerer to have literary backing. To have, you know, that I was working off of techniques that people were already using. And um, certainly 20th century detective fiction has no monopoly on this. Uh, if anyone has a monopoly on it, it would be uh, two places. Um, Elizabethan drama from the 15 and 1600s and uh, Russian literature from the 19th century. Those are, you know, notorious for these insane web works of, you know, complicated paternity and affairs and, you know, stuff like that. Um, so taking, you know, and I was, I was actually pretty familiar with both of those in quite a range as well. But the interesting thing about 20th century detective fiction was that it focused very heavily on moral confusion about it hmm. that the uh the the main character in these stories uh is especially by those by ross mcdonald is already himself a fairly alienated figure whose desire to meddle in others affairs isn't really about being a paid detective and as his novels progress you can see that that whole shtick of getting hired to solve a case which is fairly strong in his early novels, as time goes by, it becomes less and less and less part of the plot. The, the, a great deal of it had to do with encountering and partly experiencing family trauma. And um, a great deal of it had to do with the power of lies and secrets and the harms that those cause. So... Um, and, and how important everybody seems to think that the same old lies and secrets are so important to them, even though they're nothing but the same old lies and secrets that everybody has. And so um, this combination of almost pure alienation, the people are so battered and so scarred and so full of compensating behaviors that are causing all these problems, and the main character is themselves coming in from an odd moral gray zone, which is perfect for Sorcerer, for the main characters in Sorcerer. Mm -hmm. these, uh, these odd moral gray zone where he they judge, but they're not judged based on contemporary or ordinary morality. Um, the, so it was really just a very good model. And Ross MacDonald in particular wrote so many of these that it's this enormous library mm -hmm. of, of work. Um, I guess the detective, detective stories, uh, the way they, the, bag, the characters are organized, is prepared for this kind of story when, where an outsider comes into it mm -hmm. and goes around discovering this, this, all, this kind of threats, which I imagine is the, ca the case for these kind of stories when you play them. That's true, but the other important thing about the relationship map that I was using it as a technique was what it made possible was to get rid of the idea that you proceeded through each character in a prearranged sequence, as if they were rooms. And in fact, one person who was criticizing the Sorcerer's Soul in a very hostile read instantly assumed that that's what it was for. He said, oh, well, it's just a dungeon, except they're people. And you were kind of going, well, no, because first of all, what happens to each one of them is completely up in the air. Uh, that they act upon each other and they act upon the protagonists in ways that are responsive. And more importantly, you 
don't have to follow the map in a sequential fashion. You meet this person and that means you meet these other ones in that order. And it doesn't mean that you're supposed to progress through it to find something out that when you find, if there's something to find out, which there usually is, it will happen when it happens. Different characters know different things. Different characters are inclined to say different things. But your interactions with them will be determinant or will determine what kind of information comes forward. So if you find out the secret in the first five minutes or find it out, you know, only in retrospect after everything's gone to hell in a handbasket, doesn't really matter. So um, the, that's why it was a little different. I mean, that, that it, it usage as a device to help orient you as the game master turned out to have secondary effects that helped people not railroad. So many Call of Cthulhu scenarios in particular are based on a, a simple relationship map. Somebody's uncle, you know, the missing niece, calls the investigator, says, my niece is missing, and for whatever reason, the investigators all fly across the English Channel to go and, you know, to go and see. And, um... And then, you know, all you need to do now is talk to a few crazy people around town and sooner or later a monster comes and gets you in the night and, you know, you're, you've got your... You, the sequence of events to the climax mm -hmm. is pretty much fixed. Even if you bounce into this character or bounce into that character, you know, out of order, it doesn't matter. But the, the fundamentals are there. And in that case, yes, the characters are very much rooms in a dungeon. Mm -hmm. um, whereas here you've got a more dynamic thing where you don't know what's going to happen to each one and you don't know what each one is going to do, but you do know that these are the specific ties. And for whatever reason in the history of role-playing, ties of family and ties of sex had by 2000 become oddly diminished in the how-to-play materials that were being made available over the past decade. The And for whatever reason, that just seemed... Less and less and less and less important. When I was playing champions in the mid 80s, it was on everybody's mind, mainly because we were X Men and New Teen Titans fans. Mm -hmm. If you were, however, playing champions in you know 2000, it was not really very common for such things to be playing a dynamic role in the scenarios in question. And so, um, or at least if they were, and now I'm thinking of all kinds of sort of urban, slightly super games, action movie based games and so on. Yes. You know, the assassins, the two assassins were brother and sister, but it really didn't do very much. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I was trying to get it back into, to, to, to focus uh, in terms of en enhancing dynamic play. One of the things that one of the readers and big fans of Sorcerer, Jesse Bruneco, struggled with was he was very focused on the sequence of events that happens to the protagonist and saying, well, that's why the protagonist got involved was because of this particular sequence of events. How do I make that happen in play? And my argument was that people are intrinsically interested in the ties of kin and the ties of sex simply by mentioning them has got you further to people being interested than you think. And he said, that's ridiculous. Those are just two, that's, you know, cultural construction. Those aren't more important than anything else. We've got, you know, all kinds of ties, all kinds of things going on. We have jobs, we have this, we have that. And I said, yes, yes, try it. And he came back the next night after in his Deadlands game and said, I just changed one thing in my prep and I made this character that character's daughter and the NPCs. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like it. My players all went berserk over that. That was the most, it, it defined everything about the way they responded. He says, I don't, I don't get it, but it's true. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember so, a recent game of, of uh, a game called The Watch. I, we, I've mentioned it a couple yeah, of times. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, in which the kind of the mission the uh, was to uh, uh, go find a soldier that had been um, 
uh, kidnapped by the forces of evil, um, bring her back is if she wasn't compromised. And if she was, well, uh, we could not afford to leave her, let her live. Mm -hmm. So the thing, the, the, there was this whole struggle. The whole game was about deciding so we kill her, can we trust her, has been compromised by the forces of evil. What do we do with her? At the end of the game, they said that we, we have to kill her. There's nothing else we can do. They did that. And when they got back, I, I, I decided on the, on the spot that the person who has sent them to, find, to search for her was the daughter of the person they had just killed. And that killed, like that, that floored them all. Right. Even me. Right. Yeah. So those, that, the simplicity of that dynamic is not always admirable. I mean, it's it's sort of the it's, it's sort of the equivalent of having, you know, you want sympathy, you bring out a puppy with a bandaged paw. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, right. Well, it's kind of the same by saying, and that was his son. Yeah. You know, and everybody's like, oh, right. It's true. It's a blunt instrument. It's a terribly blunt instrument. And so to keep it from descending into, you know obvious manipulation is uh, is a task. But then again, people seem to have a very high tolerance for that obvious manipulation. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also, if I may def def defend myself, in that occasion, <laughs> I, I wasn't like uh, like thinking, oh, yeah, this is going to be like right. the way to get them. It, was, it really felt at that point, after all that struggle with this character, and all they went through with all the when we all the all the things they went through with it it just seemed right mm -hmm. i think uh i think you have to earn that kind of thing right right it sounds like in your case that it it uh it tied things together it made more sense in light yeah. of what had happened rather than just adding a little bit of you know a little just drenching a little sugar on top of the whole thing and yeah. they, even the players themselves kind of recon it themselves because they say oh yeah at the beginning of the game you said that only you said only to kill her if absolutely necessary i was like yeah yeah that was yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm so brilliant right well it's it's sort of the uh you know that we, we can certainly without getting too terribly distracted we could yeah. look at the empire strikes back and yeah. look at the line in the look at the line in the middle of the movie where the Darth Vader is talking to the Emperor, and the Emperor is all about, you know, you got to take this Luke Skywalker out. He's a symbol. He's this. He's that. He blew up our Death Star. You know, and get rid of this creep. There's a little pause, and Vader says, "Perhaps he can be turned." <laughs> now, at the end of the movie, and you go back and you watch it over again, you're like, genius, you know. Because now I understand what, you know, that line was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, as pure text, this is the film, this is the dialogue, this is the, you know, the sequence of events that we watched, this is how I'm going to enjoy it as such, as fiction, then yeah, sure, that's, that's great. Exactly how that relates to which creative decisions are made at which point by the people in question, well... You just go and bring that up on some Star Wars board somewhere and see where you get. Right. Yeah. So, so that's what I'm saying. Sometimes it's worth recognizing that the way these things get generated creatively comes from an intuitive stew that, that yeah, perhaps yeah. isn't... Maybe the best thing to do is just make that stew as interesting as possible as a game designer mm -hmm. rather than try to, you know, cook it for them. Okay, so can I come back to something yeah, um, yeah. Uh, from a minute ago about uh, having a relationship map as a good way to then uh, bring in the outsider and, uh, into understanding it. And, you know, there's this thing which is for someone else to explore. In, in that construction, but yes. Then, yeah. But then I was going to say in your uh, FM melodrama threads back in the day, you were kind of, as I recall, built a relationship map that very much tied the characters that uh, Jesse and people were making up directly into the, the map. Um, uh, which seemed like it worked, would have worked well given that wasn't actually something that went on the page. But... 
let's see if I'm understanding you correctly. You're talking about how if you're talking, I'm you're saying that that including the player characters in the map has its value as well. I'm just asking about it. I'm, I'm yeah, it's it's a different technique. I mean, the, the there's a couple of different ways to to think about this. First of all, there is a danger in using the techniques that I presented, which is that first of all, to even to say the word detective fiction can give the wrong impression that. To, because there's a difference between detective and mystery that I think is a hard line, not a gray line at all. That detective stories are uh, encounters with human pain and complicated backgrounds that usually include wrongdoing at a very moral level of one kind or another. Whereas mystery fiction is about solving a crime. The crime has been committed, typically a murder, but there are others. And the point is to find out the crimes. Most explicitly, the character is helping the police. Mm -hmm. But even if that's not the case, all of the other stuff is just clues and context you know, to, to establish murder means and motive means and opportunity. Whereas in detective fiction, the crime itself often takes a backseat very, very quickly. Um, the convention of, you know, coming upon a corpse or something like that, or somebody tries to hire you, you say no, then they turn up dead. Those usually are not, by halfway through the book, really what the main character cares about at all. And what matters is often... Not the crime that society would like to see exposed, but rather the crime or moral failing that everybody is mo very desperately seeking not to expose. So there's a big difference between those two kinds of fiction. So if you have, so this is a fancy way of saying, if you have a relationship map in which the player characters are not included, mm -hmm you're putting it up for risk that it's going to engage them. And you can't hold out the carrot of, well, this is the only way you're going to solve a crime, and your job here is to solve the crime. It's the same problem with Dogs in the Vineyard, mm -hmm. which I have often said is sort of my failing point for the game. When, when this happens, I instantly cease to want to continue to play with these people in this scenario. And that's the notion that, well, our goal here is to save the town. We have to find out what's wrong with the town, and we have to save it. Well, your characters may think that, but your characters are ignorant teenagers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, armed with the most dangerous thing they could possibly be armed with, which is, you know, righteousness. And so, uh, so instead of thinking them as the righteous superheroes who are going to come in and, you know, winkle out the supervillain and save the town, instead, you're, you're, I'm much more interested in the confrontation of real sticky human relationships with young idealists. That's what interests me in Dogs in the Vineyard. If you go into this mode where they say the relationship map is this thing that we have to solve, you know, it's all they're hiding it from us. We're gonna we're gonna solve it. Um, then I just lose my interest entirely. So I'm trying to describe the risk involved when the players aren't part of it. Making players part of it is just a whole completely different way of saying situation creation is not is is going to be well in progress by the time we start. And the big risk of that, and I have often said this about Ganakagok, and I think it would definitely be the case for Saga of the Icelanders until I play it and am sure, right? But it's my, my strong guess. And it's very much the case for a lot of the prepared uh, situations for Burning Wheel that they make for conventions, which is that it's all over before it began. You know, all you're going to get is the final battle. All you're going to get is, you know... A little bit of character play and then everything's going to go to hell and all of the feuds will be 
you know, settled and all of the secrets are going to, you know, come out and someone's going to kill somebody and that's what you play. But all the interesting decisions have been made before it starts. Effectively, or rather all the interesting history. There's no sense of judge. The player characters are not in a state of judgment and judgment often is facilitated when it's a revelation rather than something that you already knew and were already acting on. Um, so uh, that's why we use the term blood opera both as a simple descriptive, which is fine, but also as a risk that the problem with blood opera play is that all you're getting is the last act. Mm. And there's no sense of actually engaging with this as a situation. You know your part. You know, I am on the roaring rampage of revenge. I know what to do. So that's sort of the danger, I think, of the relationships, including the player characters, is that you lock down, well, especially when it involves things besides just those, something very specific. <clears throat> if it involves any emotion, any relationship, any institutional tie, again, you have, you're looking at this and you're saying, well, I'm done. You know, I'm looking at this glorious map we made and... Yeah, I mean, we could do a great TV miniseries now. Why? Because we know exactly how this is going to happen. Now we've got it, you know. All we have to do now is clue the viewers in as we go, you know, to all this stuff, step by step, and have everybody operating. And it's a beautiful, you know, 12-issue season of our Netflix series. Mm. But it ain't no kind of role-playing game. Mm -hmm. You so, see a lot of people online saying they're going to use microscope to do that within this campaign. And Does that happen much? How it ended. Well, people say they're doing it, and I never then hear, um, oh, and then we played it, it was great. Just, yeah, I use it. I'd like to see. I'm not saying it won't happen. And also the question of what microscope leaves open for play. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe there's a very crucial emptiness in that procedure that actually leads to a reason to really enjoy playing. You know, for, for all we know, I'm not going to say there isn't. Um, but I sure would like to see the entire process in action, if only to learn from it. Mm. So that's a, good, that's a good point. Because you're right, I, I see exactly those same things. And then the terrible cynic in me says, well, anybody can stay there and sit there and say, this is going to be great. Mm. You know, you could play off of this now. Well, have you or haven't you? I don't know. I, I see it working if you either search for an empty space, but you, there's a lot of space where you don't know what is going to happen. Even if 1,000 years in the future, Yes, yeah, so you know the earth is going to explode. Right. Whatever you have all this time, or you use it just for the backstory. Like, okay, we we play. Okay, we played until the the uh, uh, galactic empire collapse, and then this that's when we start playing with our normal game. You could do that. I actually quite like the idea of larger endings being known in many cases. Um, one of my favorites is Glorantha in which it's a given that not too long from the typical period of play, the entire world is basically going to metaphysically collapse. There will be the Ragnarok. There will be the, you know, the end of all that is. And that the world will continue, but it will be a less magical place. But it will, and, and we have been, we have played the Age of Legend. We have played the ancient world of legend. And the world from that point on interestingly enough, has is never defined in the Gloranthan, you know, books. I think Stafford was always really, really clever not to tell you what, when, when, you know, there, there was the God time when, when there was no time. We're playing since time began, but real time in an understandable cosmology of some sort has yet to begin. We are about to end the Age of Legend right now. And so I quite like that. I find that reasonably compelling because the causality involved and what the actual crises points are 
are completely left to you. So I and, and another example, a lesser example, perhaps. Um, well, there's Pendragon, in which you know the Mallory-based saga. Well, the mainly Mallory-based saga of Arthur is going to occur. But you're playing quite a bit of that intermediate history, not to find out what happens in that regard, but to see about your knight in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. And um, Circle of Hands takes its cue directly from Pendragon in a slightly vaguer sense, in that we know that this young king in this one area is going to become the ruler of the whole region. We know that the society is going to transform. We don't know what it's going to be like, and we don't know what, uh, well, we don't know how the primary agents of change, which is the circle, experienced it. And I even put a punchline in there that most of the adventures they have will, regardless of of how they play out at the table will facilitate that process. So even if the whole thing's a disaster and all but one of the knights is killed and the village is left a smoking ruin and they never stopped the bad wizard, even if that is the case, typically in the long run, that will have facilitated the rule and the consolidation of power and the end of the magical war. And you don't have to explain how or why. That's not important. Mm. So the what it really throws into relief that what we're interested in is these characters. Mm. And, and what they insight into them changes our view of the whole thing. Uh, I mentioned this in Circle of Hands. That the, the Stars series Spartacus is not about whether Spartacus lives or dies, or his rebellion succeeds or fails. Those are given. Mm -hmm. What matters is who are these people? And I think that that's actually very powerful. Um, there's a, you know, a number of other examples. So when, I, when we talk about knowing how you know, it ends, I don't think that's really a variable that's too important. When I was talking about it all being over except for that last bit, my criticism of the over-involved relationship map with the player characters in it, um, my criticism is that is not about like what's going to happen to the kingdom. My criticism is knowing what the player characters are pretty much going to be doing. That you look at it and your part is practically scripted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the part. That's that's the criticism I'm having. Something I was thinking about that and how games avoid that danger. So when you have when you the players are the outsider, they are the ones that are creating the disruption that that stops that from happening. When you are the insider, you do need something else. An right. insider or some some front, you know, in a, in a focus world games or whatever, that disrupt that relationship and throws everything into chaos. And that's when you can play to find out or whatever. One of the trickiest things in Sorcerer is that every character comes with a player written bang or a kicker, which is the disruption in their life, which is supposed to be the most important thing that is, is I mean, this is why we're looking at the character at this time, because this is when this happens. And, um, to reconcile that with being the outsider in a relationship map circumstance is actually very interesting. That is not something I developed well in that supplement, learning how to do that without simply making the character a member of the relationship map to begin with is a subtle technique. And I can see why people encountering that would say, well, what the hell? Just put them in there. That'll make it easier. Well, yeah, sorry. Say, yeah, yeah. Okay. please, Alec. Yeah. Um, if I may some, say something, because uh, I, my brother reminds me that I need to go in a moment. Oh, okay. Um, 
I just want to point out that uh, I think what I I uh, like um, took from your your lecture, let's say, which was really interesting. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> is it, no, that was really like my head was like oh, okay, okay, it and thinking about my campaign that I'm conducting and what uh, what I will for sure take from it is that making this relationship that you mentioned or even implying them that they might be there uh might uh, should as you said from your experience that it will make players yeah feel like oh maybe maybe like imagine that you're introducing npc characters that like like his history aligns with the player characters in some way and he says like maybe he's, he's my relative but i don't know about or possibly like um or, that, oh, go ahead yeah yeah or like someone from the outside is like implying that he's your relative like i am your brother or something and like, is he like and the, i i think that the player i personally as a player i would feel like Okay, maybe he is, or maybe he isn't. Like, there's a story to discover. Not like it's not for sure that I created that this person is my my brother, but it might be, you know. So that's uh, kind of an interesting boundary area between being in and out of the relationship map for a player character. You're kind of in yeah. the in an unknown zone. That's an interesting point, but one of the things I found um, is that even without including the player characters. Yeah. It's like I was talking about before. It's often very powerful. A, a good way to put it was, uh, I think it was Seth Ben Ezra, who said that two guys fighting is kind of interesting. Two brothers fighting yeah. is intrinsically interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Even that's, if that's, 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 so, it's not whether your player character is interested to know, but you, the player, is yeah, intrinsically interested when, to know. Yeah. My second conclusion okay. that uh, adding this flavor to characters, to NPCs, that they have maybe a daughter, daughter or something, they have a family reason to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like, this and it can be like, positive or negative too. Yeah. That's the nice thing. It's yeah, wide it's, open, right? Yeah, exactly. That that gives like a very strong um, push to do something. Yeah, your family needs something, or you hate your family, mm -hmm. or like or your lover or whatever she was your lover that's why he killed her or like yeah mm -hmm. that's uh, that's you know that 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 this even like and i'm not and i'm uh, seeing this in even these games that are not basically about relations right. relationships right like you play basic fantasy game yeah and the character that you kidnap have a family or like something and you he just put, like you don't know if he says that he has family and he lies or right. he really have a family that he cares about, and that's why he was doing bad things, yeah, right. or something right. like that. Yeah? So that's that's something to worth or like for like not so, so much experienced GMs are, are, as me to give like somewhere, not everywhere maybe, but right. Make it nice when it when it hits, it punches very hard, and um, and you can kind of see why everybody went in the in the community that I'm talking about kind of went crazy for a while with game designs that were almost about nothing else yeah. you know um but but definitely true so do you have to do you have to go yeah yeah i really okay. need to go I was thanks for joining us i yeah. appreciate it yeah thank you for having me um so yeah i will probably watch this uh, <laughs> all right yeah yeah Bye -bye. we'll continue take care yeah. cool um, so, Herman, did you want to, to tell us a little bit more about your experiences with this or any system thoughts that you've come across? Um, I was thinking while, while listening to other games where, where uh, you encounter things like family and send things. I don't know if any of you have ever played uh, Ember, Ember Dices. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Also, of course, as in the background, all the family and the, the stuff right. which... Uh, yeah, that's another game, very early game in these terms, which mandated that the player characters are indeed part of a very significant family, yeah. you know, relationship map on that basis. Yeah, which was what, was, um, what made me think, like, oh yeah, that's another one which, which has the, yeah. uh, 
uh, and, and in which there are, well, I've played a couple of campaigns with that and a whole bunch of um, uh, at, at Embercom UK in, in, in England uh, convention scenarios where you have to do whatever it is in a couple of hours. So that's all, all, always a sort of cooking pot to whatever the game designer, game master uh, comes up with. Uh, sometimes uh, like a throne war where everything you have, yeah, there's, there's, there's only one throne and everyone, everyone right. has it. Right. And other games where yeah. it's more like cooperative or more like, okay, let's explore what, what it means to be a, a dysfunctional family like this is. Right, right. One of the interesting things that I always liked about Amber Diceless was that, um, especially since the first game is based very much on the first five books, and yep. not on not like Shadow Knight, which is based on the Merlin oh, books. The but the thing with uh, Amber Diceless, when I make up a character for it, not only am I picking the known scion of Amber mm -hmm. that is my parent, but I also have to think in terms of who the other partner was, who the other parent is. And that gives rise to making... You're actually not just adding yourself to the existing relationship map. You're actually adding a whole node. And that is, I think, kind of powerful. Properly, in my opinion, every game of Amber Diceless is its own thing because yeah. of that. You have a new map of the royal family of, of Amber that no other group has mm -hmm. at yes. that point, looking at the player characters and necessarily two individuals that they've added if not more mm -hmm. and of course in even without the incredibly dedicated fandom for the series you still have the the basic idea of family trauma i mean that 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 feuds between family members are charged with great and powerful you know consequences yeah. and that's saga of the icelanders of course is completely you know draws upon that same mm -hmm. dynamic um i've often another great i should have pointed this out too about those literary underpinnings one of my biggest influences in terms of books is Njal's saga mm -hmm. which is you know one of the great icelandic sagas and certainly lies at the heart of sagas of the icelanders it's one of the most complete that we have and it's mm -hmm. It's really, you know, it has a proper ending and everything. You know, it's really good. Yeah. One of the interesting points of Njal's saga is that it really is lacking a central heroic figure. There is no hero's journey. There is no, uh, you know, following this one character through their arc of development. And many of the characters do change as they age and switch sides or have different values than they had when they were younger and all kinds of good things like that. There's a lot of character development, but there isn't the completely focused kind of Hollywood fixed character that you're supposed to identify with and go through these very specific stages with. Um, so uh, instead, it very much does have that sprawling, you know, follow this character for a while, you know, feel to it um, that uh, really takes you through the community in a lot of ways, but also lets you see how disaster, you know, gets facilitated from multiple angles and from multiple causes. Um, I love that. Uh, John Sales is the filmmaker who has dedicated a great deal of his career toward exploring that as story structure. Um, and he calls it the ecology of a film, and by which he means the web work of institutions and social relationships and backstories and, you know, and, and very much in the McDonald, Ross McDonald tradition of the, the history of pain and how coping with pain on an individual basis has shaped you into what you are doing at this time. And... Um, he likes to say that he could have made the movie from the favoring any of the characters in terms of screen time. And he chose which characters to favor, that you could call the main character, but they're only the main character in terms of how much time the camera spends on them. 
It's the only reason they're the main character. They're not intrinsically the main character in terms of plot, or even in terms of the meaning or the importance or the intensity of things. And I like that. I kind of I, I kind of enjoy role playing which is so necessarily player character centric so much of the time. Mm -hmm. And I think over influenced by cinema and TV. So that we think that we're supposed to make it look like that. Um, that I really, you know, if, if, if anything, I like to go over into that territory instead and see what happens. And that's why intrinsic sources of attention and conflict are so interesting to me because I'm not setting up what the conflicts are supposed to be about. Um, thinking about why family relationships are so um, effective, uh, I, I think in the three story, the kind of the, the public sphere of uh, human relationships, uh, politics, and all that has been uh, very strongly ruled and regulated. Uh, uh, but the private sphere, family, especially, has traditionally uh, has been kind of left uh, unspoken. And basically, the most most of the time, men were the uh, the, the father was uh, responsible of the family, that kind of stuff. But what happened there was kind of a little bit more undecided. So there's this, uh, there's more space for making moral right. arguments that are not regulated by laws. There's a, a big well, history. Well, there's also a very painful interaction between those two because the dynamics of the family are the first thing that its members are going to say override the law if we say so. Yeah. Always like and and, and and even people who are otherwise very law abiding and would always use it to justify their actions. Oh no! Except now, this is our decision, my decision regarding my family member. You can't tell me what to do. No law counts. And even if you don't do that, like when someone does something crazy because of family, you always say, you always always say, yeah, that's illegal, and I think it should be punished. But I understand why he, why he did it or why they did well, it. Well, I mean, this goes to so many different, I mean, this is all issues of reproductive rights are, and I use that word very carefully. I, put, I did an interesting expression when I use the word rights because that's exactly where the legal concept of rights vanishes because nobody's going to take seriously anyone else's notion of what should be legal about it. They say, no, forget it. This is family talk. Yeah. Forget it. And so, um, you know, and at that point you end up with policy making, which often resembles family feuding. Um, mm -hmm. Any kind of argument I wrote in one of my biology blog pieces about the, uh, the, the, characteristic family breakdowns in the context of a funeral um, and and why on earth this would occur. Um, we, we talked also, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about uh, the, the conflicts of stories insofar as they relate to ties of kin and sex and then how those clash with the ties of institutional membership responsibility, law, and the sense of community. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a great deal of power in all of this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think the intrinsic interest, the attention, that especially if you don't use it as a blunt instrument, you know, to, to make people care, it's, uh, it's funny. Somebody who says, well, you can't, you know, I'm, I'm not manipulable. You know, you can't give me an injured puppy with a bandaged paw, you know, and expect me to fall over all over in sympathy about it. But they do if you sneak up on them. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so. You can remind me of this playing a 4-3 four, four, game and suddenly you've got two brothers and sisters who you have to care about which one of them you're going to take over the power of. 
huge crystals, things like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can think of a game where that might happen. Yeah, that's true. And actually, that was kind of interesting. It's a very sneaky example on my part. Because I introduced them as brother and sister, and all the three player characters are the three players said, aha, brother-sister dynamic, and you were reasonably interested on the basis that we talked about. And then the take-home ultimately was that they weren't really properly brother and sister in the way you guys were thinking at all. And so, and so that actually sort of jacked it up a notch that you guys had become interested at the personal level, ultimately. And the, especially after I played them as personalities for a little bit longer. I mean, they, they, people started getting interested in them. Oh, the brother and the sister, right? And then when it turns out that this isn't really what they were, they perceived themselves as such, as you knew them. But ultimately, the metaphysical bullshit that Gordon's character in particular was very invested in, and that freaking arcana role of his made into a very important plot element... Um, sort of the fact that I was able to actually pull the rug out from you. It's the reverse technique, right? Yeah. To, to pull the rug out from you that they aren't really brother and sister like that after all. Um, yes. Yeah, that's, that, that is kind of interesting. As I was thinking about that too, I was like, did I do that in that game? And I was like, no, I did something else with it or on top of it. Um, but it's a good example. And I've, I, I've, I know I've talked about this in a seminar before. Long ago, when I played a game of third edition Dungeons and Dragons, um, the uh, I know I've talked about this. This is this is on record, on record now. Um, a player came up with two brothers as his player characters because everybody was playing two characters, and he said, "Well, I'm going to make my two characters brothers." And I was thinking, "Well, you know, is that just going to be kind of like a four legged character?" You know. That's not that interesting. But what do you have in mind? He said, actually, half-brothers. One's a half-orc and one's a half-elf. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, sold. <laughs> you know? So was, that was the opposite. That wasn't the game master, like, nailing the the player with his NPCs. That was the, the player just, I was just like, best characters out mm -hmm. of the gate ever. And you just handed me, I, you know, they, and he pointed out they have the same mother, a human mother. And I, you just handed me the world's best NPC to make up. So, yes, you know. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, it makes you say, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Let's go back and look at some of the old play materials. Let's go back and look at High Fantasy that I played the uh, I played the solo adventure in. And uh, one of the NPCs in that solo adventure is your character's cousin that the opening text actually makes your character a little bit antagonistic toward. And you never get. I never met played, Daisy. Right? I was very upset about that. I was like, I've I've got to play that again and like pick different numbers just so I can eventually run into her and find out what that was all about because the setup for it was obviously so strong and her stats are given like as for a player character in the beginning, so she's one of the you know one of the characters who's fully written up. So it's clear that she's you know not not a trivial piece of this setup. But so you can find that in there. Um, I'm finding, oh, this brings us to one last thing. This brings us to a very tricky word in the history of role playing clan. Because in role playing, the word has taken on a very specific meaning, which is quite similar to club or gang or political party. And I will yeah. go further and if you go into certain game, I will ask another name. <laughs> it's basically a character class. Like you are. You mean the games? Kind of what game was that? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, but yes, you're right. I mean, and yes, character class for sure. And to shift over from that game into a game that was that it highly influenced, Legend of the Five Rings. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Which they is very much you know written in precisely the same nature of what a clan is. And let's take a look at some of these things because socially speaking, they don't really match clans as a human historical phenomenon. And I've actually found that few people in the modern day even know what the word clan technically means. Um, what it means is extended family in which obligations and social roles are focused toward each other's interests. And it doesn't, I mean, it's, and what's very important is that clans outbreed. You marry outside your clan, and either you go join that clan or they come and join yours. So at any given time, a substantial number of your clan was not born into it. So it's not a, a, a genealogical isolated thing and so it is it's always being gotten into and it's always being gotten out of and some individuals are born into it and stay in it and marry somebody who comes in maybe or something like that um but clan membership isn't the same as family membership i mean a great deal of the members of your clan are if anything second or third cousins to you we should recognize that clans exist today and that when people ask you about where you're from and if they get a little bit more interested in you, you're going to be giving them information that corresponds to clan. You won't call it that. But that's what they want to know, especially if they're familiar with your culture. And so we still have them. We just don't use the word. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting in some cultures in the United States, some subcultures, the word cousin takes on a very powerful meaning, you know, oh yeah, that's my cousin. Well, they don't mean an actual cousin. They mean somebody in that web work of semi relationship and semi obligation. My people, these are my people that also can be used in exactly that sense. It's a very powerful aspect of life though. I find that it's very tricky when clan in role-playing games has taken on both a mechanical different meaning. We, this clan has these powers and also a very different meaning. Well, in vampire you have the who bit who. So it's a form of reproduction you know, basically through adoption. Um, and then you have uh, uh, other, like in, that's where Legends of the Five Rings really, you know, confused me. I was like, what on earth is this clan? Everybody's marrying in the clan. You know, it's a big deal when someone marries outside the clan. Everyone else is like, ooh. And you're kind of going, well, wait a minute, you know. In that sense, Bumper had a little bit of a, it, it worked a little bit better because Although, yeah, the clan was like, whatever. The who beat who and, oh, he's right. the child of the master of my master. Absolutely, right. Ago, right. I was like, oh. Yeah, the, the mechanism was, of course, fantastic. But the basic idea of a web work of relationships that, you know, that, that had causes, you know, was was interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, but uh, but anyway, so that concept of clan, which, as you say, very properly was a new word for character class, so that you could say that you know we're not like that battle D and D, we're the new way to role play, you know, yeah. and so um, you have this interesting, real relationship between social historical identifiers and expectations and then you have kin and sex as components within it that are not synonymous with it and a great deal of our literature is based on family versus clan conflicts that's that's a, a huge part of of human the human experience 
role playing to me seems to be to to sometimes struggle between those two levels of play or sorry those two levels of of interaction that we can identify with easily um it's it's one of the things that's vastly missing from cyberpunk for example um you've got your you your boyfriend or girlfriend and then you've got the corporations and there's just there's nothing to work with in between Um, alienation you're alienated from your clan don't have anyone well that's part of it makes you very boring right well it's part of it but it also uh leads to one of the flaws in gibson's work in particular which is that he is writing action movies and so um or fashion shoots maybe actually say again please it's not, it's, i don't think it's about the action though. it's about the still life and you know all the, kind of the action is less important than the well the of, more or less I, I, well, yes but not, I, I mean, don't like this, but, yeah the but yes, the 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 thing i'm kind of getting at is that the characters do have their kind of situational crisis that they deal with and that's the story mm-hmm. um yeah it's um cool there's a game uh that kira Magwan is developing that is all about it's a cyberpunk game but it's basically about building a a, a community and, and protecting your community of of uh of basically people outside the system that has to resist the the, the influence of the corporations and it does try to go that way that uh, right. community uh, way yeah in the uh, in the original cyberpunk it was very strongly oriented toward raging against the machine you were the outlaw rock and roller you yeah. were the idea yeah. you know the biker with a cause you were you know that that kind of thing uh, you were the corporation guy who was going to betray them from within you know who found his heart um and that kind of fell away very quickly in in the in the course of the development of the game but uh, but at least in the very basic core book material, originally that was a big part of it. But it didn't provide any notion of what on earth you would do to to do anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, and and Ross, you're right. I mean, a big part of that was alienation. A big part of it was just the kind of punkish cry of defiance with well, nowhere to with yeah, nowhere to go. Right. It's about setting up a situation where you cannot possibly do anything. So right. About right. Mega corporations. It's like you know it makes. Right. Almost no sense. Yeah. Um, as much as it's completely justified. But... Yeah. Uh, yeah, talking with the author of The Spall, the Cyberpunk game, one of the points he, he intentionally put in the game, one of the things he intentionally put in the game is that there's n- there's no way to fight against the corporations. You can fight against the indiv- individual agents they send and that kind of stuff, but there's no mechanics or any other way to destroy a corporation. Right. At the end, they right. always win. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that's definitely a way to go with that. Or, or you make a different game, but it's not, as you said, about exactly. Yeah, fight and get the system. Well, that's well, that's where Kira's game becomes interesting. I mean, these are these are different. You know, Kira's game is specifically about uh, about looking at it a different way. Um, and I'm also thinking that a, a great deal of the literary cyberpunk is extraordinarily romantic because it's the power of love that saves the day. <laughs> you know, it's all about the reconciliation. They all begin with you know, oh, characters on opposite sides or characters who are estranged, and you know, in order to fight against the man, you know, reconciliation, romantic reconciliation, and connection has to happen. Um, so yeah, the big cyber sex scene is a huge part of most of these. It's actually one thing I do like about Gibson. Actually, Gibson doesn't go that route. Unlike nearly all the well, others. One, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts? Uh... Maybe one for oh. the for the next uh, seminar in, uh, about this topic is we've talked a lot of, we've talked about a lot about family relationships. Uh, it would be cool to try to think how to what's the best way to build these kind of relationships where family the relationship is not an option where you're playing like a uh, yeah, like an urban status game style where it's almost impossible to have everyone be the cousin of someone. Um, what kind of things should you look at? 
and how you should look at it to find what's the important stuff that you put, should put in the relationship map. I think for in for inspiration for me, obviously there are thousands of ways you could do it, but instantly I think of the game that we talked about in the, the science fiction television seminar, um, which was uh, Ghost in the Shell standalone complex, where you have extraordinarily profoundly alienated protagonists and one of the best things about it is that they seek and understand relationships of this kind but they cannot have them you're you're not the power of love is not going to save anybody in that series you know the the uh but perceived or constructed kinship turns out to be difficult for the characters. Um, and uh, and I actually quite like the intelligence of how they handled it. Um, every so it wasn't that blatant and then every so often there would be an episode where it was very blatant and it was a perfect example of having it sneak up on you. All of a sudden you're completely teary-eyed over how this cyborg will never understand exactly what it means to have a sister. Or they do understand and they remember, but memory is all they've got. You know, so, and you're sitting there sniffling away at this, you know, you know, and, uh, and you, you're, you're cynical, you're cynical, arms folded, you know, TV watcher, seen it all, is totally taken, you know, by surprise. I think you could do some really interesting things with that because the lack is profound. It's not merely a lack, okay, we'll do something else. Mm. It's a meaningful absence. I guess one way to look at it, and what's the essence of that, is that if you look at the way characters in that setting, in the, in the, in the premise, normally interact, on what level they interact, do they interact professionally, uh, that kind of stuff, and then you, th you look for the relationships that escape for that from that like yeah instead no we normally this is just the guy who i work with and he's the fixer in my game or right the, right or the killer or whatever but this other guy is the one who saved me that time we went on a mission right and he didn't have to do that so those kind of resources that escape from the kind right of normalized well apocalypse world and its spawn um work with this because yeah. you have the role the character class your role in what your character will do relative to what everyone else does which in canonical apocalypse world is fixed you're the only one mm -hmm. so those roles are important vectors if you have a game with you know a chopper and a gun lugger and um you know Who's the, who's the 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 one who the fixer the the smoother of the way the, the operator. right right the operator you got an operator a chopper and a gun lugger and those are your player characters well okay you got your vectors there very different than if you have uh you know a hard holder and a skin a hard holder a skinner and you know and I'm thinking of some and, and an angel right. Mm -hmm. You get those three together and these other three together. You've got a completely different setup. And you would say, okay, well, we're set. We're done. No. Then he throws in the history mm -hmm. to create a conflicting web work <laughs> of those relationships. That And so that's kind of a very deliberate design on his part. Because that's another game in which that family and extended family level of societal structure is basically absent. Um, it is kind of interesting. There is no HX in Apocalypse World that I remember that says that person is your child. Mm -hmm. You know, HX2 with them, you know, or something like that. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 it's a game in which that absence is not trivial. It's not scattered randomly through the different options for HX per skin either. It's just not there. Um, so that's that is kind of an example of what you're talking about, I think. 
Cool. Um, yeah, we'll see yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, thinking about some of the other weird things that I've done. Um, Circle of Hands is similar in that you break. All the characters have broken from their former life in order to become part of the circle. Um, and so you have a community-based, mission-based, if you will, team-based identity. Um, but nobody, but in the case of Circle of Hands, I kind of like it. Nobody knows what the team is supposed to do. You just, you do what you think is right. Yeah, you, well, you do. You, you voluntarily went to go do that thing. Each character, no, the king does not send you on missions and say, you, you, and you, go. You know, the, the, the three of you have chosen to go riding off because you heard about this thing. Um, the, uh, there's a few others that, that I'm kind of thinking of. Troll Babe is an interesting example in which the character is very disconnected from, you know, it's, it's not surprised to me that a lot of people build family backgrounds for their Troll Babes through play. Mm -hmm. That doesn't surprise me a bit. What about, one? Well, the last thought I have is, what about play that says, pish posh, who needs it? Is there is there a functional case study of play in which this is not value added? Any such thing across this wide range, you know, of things. I confess I have a hard time. I mean, I've played sort of self-aware dungeon crawls particularly with tunnels and trolls that were like that. Um, but that's something I'll think about. I'll probably have to comment on it later. If I, if I suddenly realize there's a whole family of game design or game experience in which this is not value added. Um, but it's certainly not coming to mind at the moment. No, there's good games, plenty where it's not not a big thing in the game or in the the game text. Right. But take right. take take certainly uh, more recent things like like Traveler or something, which add in connections and stuff between right. characters. Right. Right. Uh, right. Where maybe the or original text was just so plain that it wasn't in there, but you still had the the, the example character who might have right right connections or. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the other. I think that's it's kind of tricky because we're since we're talking about play, not texts. Yeah, it's it's certainly the case that any game that we could mention, very likely here and there, had groups that you know brought this material in intrinsically and constantly and yeah, like, yeah. like your example of the two, the, the, the twin brothers right, uh, right. Uh, in the third edition game. Right, which which certainly isn't in that way in the game text. Right, there's nothing in the game text about that whatsoever. Um, but it's easily added yeah. and, and um, um, yeah, and, and has a value in in, in, in play, like it surprises mm -hmm. people, it adds value, etc. Right, right, and well, it gives you things to make up and things to make decisions yeah. about and curiosity. I mean, everybody else at the table was kind of like, when are we going to meet the mom? I mean, what's she like? Mm -hmm. Um. It's, it's also a big deal, of course, in my current work with champions. That uh, Now, in the Cosmic Zap game, it uses the Hero Quest system, which is way about community and way about uh, relationships. I mean, that whole personal yeah. thing that I have in there, is, it's, it's, it's just built in. Your character is walking around with sort of these characters in history sticking off their back in many ways. But in the case of champions, if you don't start thinking about that, then you're not going to know, you're not going to be able to spend half your points. And so you can tell when somebody doesn't do it, the character is absurdly bland, mechanically bland. Mm -hmm. So actually knowing this stuff about your character suddenly makes a hundred things snap together in terms of how you're spending points, such that your character simply wouldn't make sense without knowing that without that having be operative. Um, so yeah, the idea of building, you know, building a pile of powers and saying, my guy can do this, and then naming all the different kind of energy blasts they have and stuff, that is exceptionally 
unsuccessful in terms of point spending in the original champions. Thanks again. Yeah, thank for, you for attending. Uh, thank yeah. you for talking to uh, yeah. all of you. Good deal. All right, everybody. We'll talk to you later on. Yeah. Bye. Bye.